first year coordinator of the Newport Honor Society. Uh, that means that I run the 1L competition, which you are all required to participate in as part of the curriculum for your writing class. There's a lot of people in front of you with me. Um, so just kind of going down the line, I want to introduce um, Rebecca Nieder, the president of the Newport Honor Society, Brendan Gibbons, um, vice president of the appellate division of the Newport Honor Society, Liz Conroy, one of our national team members, Kevin Schaefer, another national team member, Imre Aish, um, another VP of appellate, and Katie Riley, the Prince Coordinator. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of the society, um, we are two divisions within one society. We have the trial division and the appellate division. So trial, as most of you know, had their tryouts um, already. And the appellate tryouts, because they go in conjunction with your brief, occur um, at the close to, or to the end of the semester. Um, so just to keep in mind, this is an honor society, so some um, some people might you know really want this in the sense that it's a great on your resume. There are certain employers that specifically look for this um, on your resume. Um, past that, it's it's just a really great for, for me personally. It's a great society to be a part of. It's um, a lot of fun, and you learn a lot um, each year. The society hosts the Jerome Prince Evidence. Um, moot court competition. Um, I'd like to invite each of you to attend the final round, which will take place in this room on Saturday, March 28th at 4 p.m. Um, when you attend, you'll be able to see four extremely um, impressive advocates who have made it to a final round with um, three judges from across the country judging them. And it's a really great way to kind of energize you right before you try out for the society. So the competition itself, um, as you, hopefully your teachers have told you, the competition takes place from March 30th through April 26th, and we'll extend invitations to the, to the society, both trial and appellate, at the conclusion of that time. At this point, some of your professors have probably told you approximately when your class will be competing in the final, um, in the first round. The logistics of the competition are as follows. Tryouts take place in the library, um, in various rooms throughout the library, usually during the late afternoon and evening hours. Uh, you'll go into the library, there's a table, you check in, they'll tell you what room you are scheduled to argue in, you go to your room. Um, there's going to be three moot court uh, te uh, team members in the room, um, and they will be your judges during the first round. Um, the scoring, which everyone is very uh, concerned about. Um, so in the first round, your brief grade that you received um, will be worth 60% of your overall score, and your oral argument will be worth 40% of your overall score. Uh, in the second round, we swap the numbers, and at 60% of your is your oral argument, and 40% is your brief. Um, in the second round, we also invite professors to judge in some of the rounds, so you won't always have three moot court judges. You might have two moot court judges and a professor. Um, the judges will be um, asking you questions off of what's called a bench brief, so each of your professors have um, prepared briefs so that we know what the issues are, what the case law is, um, and kind of, we're, we can't read, we're not reading everyone's briefs, obviously. Um, so. Your brief is very separate from your oral argument. Um, so with respect to the, the different rounds, so the first round is part of the first year curriculum. Um, everyone has to try out. Um, with that in mind, please understand, I'm doing my best to schedule all 400 tryouts at this time. Um, and I'm trying to do it when you don't have class, which as you all probably know, your you have classes all the time, and you all have very different schedules. Um, so please try not to change around when you're trying out, unless it's extenuating circumstances like um, Sabbath, a holiday, um, thing, you know, an emergency, things of that nature, um, and you need to contact me immediately. Um, these, 
if you are concerned about those dates, um, you can also speak to your professors um, and they will tell you which week your first round will be because they've all been notified. The second round is not mandatory. The top 25% of each class in the first round will be invited back to try out in the second round. <clears throat> Even though it's not mandatory, um, I would highly encourage anyone who makes it to the second round to come to the second round, try it. Um, sometimes people don't think they're gonna enjoy doing this and they find out after the first round or even the second round, that wow, this is something that's really, it's fun and I really enjoy this and I'd really like to be a part of this. So I really would encourage everyone, um, if you have the chance to try out in the second round, to come to the second round. Okay, so a little bit about the, what we call moot courtisms and um, the competition guideline. So the packets that I asked everyone to pick up in there um, are, what we call the moot courtesans. It's um, four pieces of paper that you should probably read a few times before trying out. Um, it includes a lot of like just the different words we use, uh, the way that we kind of address the court. It's very helpful in structuring your argument. Um, your professors will talk to you about this and you all have an oral argument class, but it's also just so that, you know, it's something nice to kind of have a reminder um, we give this to new members of the society just also as a reminder of how we kind of operate um, across the board at Brooklyn. So additionally, while I hope everyone has cultivated relationships with 2Ls and 3Ls, um, we have a policy in which uh, current members are not allowed to help prep you for your oral arguments. So you will have ample time with your professors to prepare for oral arguments, but an actual society member cannot um, cannot help you. Um, the dress code for tryouts is business, just as if you're going on uh, an interview. Suits, ties for men, um, everything of that nature. Um, that being said, um, while we cannot assist you in preparing your personal or oral argument, we can show you some great oral arguments to kind of base, base your practice off of. That is where our wonderful national team members come into play. Um, they are both going to perform very different oral arguments and then they will discuss with you um, the different parts and it's kind of the do's and don'ts of new court. So without further ado, Jackie. Thank you. Can I start? Yes. Uh, would you rather take a brief recitation of the facts? Great. Get going. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, the petitioner, Chuck Duncan, was an employee of the respondent, Big Martin Incorporated, for about 22 years before he was wrongfully terminated on the basis of his race. Uh, before he was terminated, Mr. D uh, Mr. Duncan was one uh, of 20 employees at the distribution center. He was the only white employee. The 19 other employees were black or Hispanic, uh, and they frequently had arguments over what to play on the radio at work. Uh, his 19 black and Hispanic coworkers wanted to listen to rap, hip hop, and Latin language music, and he wanted to listen to country music. Uh, a month before he was terminated, um, his supervisor, a black man, gave him a performance evaluation, uh, which rated him adequate to good in every category of his job. And then only a month later, after that positive job review, 
was he terminated because, quote, he was not a good fit for the team. This court should reverse the decision of the 12th Circuit Court of Appeals because they got it totally wrong. But turning to my first point, uh, the court uh, incorrectly concluded that Spierkovich was overturned by Twombly and Iqbal. And the court did not overturn Spierkovich and Twombly and Iqbal. The cases were totally different. Twombly mentioned it favorably. Iqbal didn't mention it at all. So the 12th Circuit got it plainly wrong for a couple of reasons. One, um, but are they even, I mean, even if, even if they weren't overturned per se, are they really that compatible? I mean, is there anything left of Spierkovich once you once you start seeing things through the prism of plausibility. Yeah, definitely, Your Honor. Um, Twombly, uh, as I said, cited it favorably. Iqbal didn't cite it at all. Um, they definitely established the plausibility standard, but there's no reason why that can't work with Spierkovich, so they, they totally work, yeah. But, Counselor, can you tell us the procedural history of those cases, specifically the dates? Because we need to know if, you know, what date Spierkovich was in order to determine if we overruled it. Um, Spierkovich was, I'm sorry, I don't know, um, it was, it was like less than 15 years ago, it was before Twombly and Iqbal, so pretty recent. Um, when was, when was Twombly, when was Iqbal? Twombly was, uh, 2005-ish, I think, Iqbal was a couple years later, sorry. Um, but yeah, so, so because of the stare decisis, because of the age of Spierkovich, because uh, a lot of lower courts cited, there's no reason why uh, the lower court would have been correct in concluding that it's not good law anymore. It was silly. Shouldn't we assume that if Sir Spierkovich cites the Connolly Gibson factors yeah. Yeah. and uh, Twombly and Iqbal create a new pleading standard, uh -huh. that shouldn't we just assume that this court meant to overturn Spierkovich? No, you're not. That wouldn't be right. Um, moreover, Spierkovich isn't incompatible with the two cases. I mean, they, they work together. It's not like they present like totally head-butting. What does Spierkovich stand for? Um, Spierkovich was uh, a Title VII case. It was a guy who um, claimed he was fired because of his national origin. <coughs> um, and the court there uh, said that everyone plays by the same rules. The federal rules, civil procedure, were just uh, they apply across the board. So, explain the holding, please. Uh, the holding was that, as like I said, Your Honor, it was, it was the, the rules are uh, trans-substantive, as the court said. So uh, there's no like that's it, it's the same. Counselor, that's before Twombly, and that's before Iqbal. Right. Yeah. Well, the plausibility standard is different now. You acknowledge that? I I, I don't agree with that, Your Honor. No. Um, I mean, it, it didn't exist then. It exists now. Um, maybe, maybe Your Honor didn't understand my point correctly, so let me, let me repeat it a different way. Uh, it's a, this is just a, a different gloss. Twombly and Iqbal were a different gloss on the same rules that applied before. So uh, this court shouldn't declare that it's overturned, as the 12th Circuit did, uh, quite incorrectly. So um, well, can, can you help us understand then, Counselor Justice Kennedy's words, that plausibility is the new standard in all federal cases? Well, that's Justice Kennedy's opinion. Uh, the court can certainly uh, reach a different one if it wants. Um, it depends on how you know, the Justice Kennedy's writing the majority or not. But uh, no, it's it's not. It was new, but it's not it's not incompatible. So how do you win under these facts? How do you how do you say you have a plausible claim? Well, we do win here, Your Honor. That's uh, part of the reason why uh, we, we think that this case is a perfect because the facts are, are good. Because he uh, he was what, he was there twenty two years, right? And um, I mean, they had these arguments over the radio stations. Like, clearly, there's like some racial undertones there I mean, because he wanted to listen to country music. He was the only guy who wanted to listen to country music, and, uh, and the performance evaluation. So we think we win. Do we use the Do we use the the elements of a Title VII claim to, to see if something is plausible, and what are those elements? If, if we do, and or if we don't, why not? And how much weight should we put to the fact that there are racial overtones in the facts pled, but no? actual evidence of racial discrimination? Um, uh, I'm going to answer Your Honor's question first, and we'll, we'll get to that one with my other point. Um, I'm sorry, could you, could you, what did you say again? I have no idea. <laughs> um, what, 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 did, what did Your Honor say? Um, I asked if what weight we should put to racial overtones, oh, but yeah, in yeah. the complaint, right, right, right. if they don't make out uh, a clear statement of racial discrimination. 
Well, it's up to it's it's going to be up to the trial judge, and, and it'll be up to, to you guys here to read whatever that means. But we think it's clear enough. I mean, there's there's no like, how else are you going to characterize those those arguments? So especially in, in the context of you know. So are you basically arguing that if a district judge thinks that there's discrimination, it's good enough for him, it's, it's discrimination? Or is there any other standard that you're, you're, you're advocating for us looking for? Kind of. Um, it, it, because we, we give deference to the judge. So yeah, kind of. So if we hold today that we reaffirm it while yeah. it's the plausibility standard for all federal cases, uh -huh. then do you still win using your facts? And, and what is your strongest fact? I think we win. Yeah, uh, the strongest fact is the, um, I think it's the arguments over the radio. That's, that's my opinion. I mean, you guys could come up with something different, but that, that's, that's like the most persuasive, Isn't I guess. it possible that the arguments over the radio um, just show that your client was getting into altercations with other coworkers? And it goes to the fact that he was just not a good fit with the rest of his coworkers and the rest of the team. No, no, we don't. We, that's that's not because if you talk to him, you know that's that's not the case. And if you read the complaint, I mean, it, it doesn't come off that way. So, um, anything else? Um, do, do your honors have any questions for me or? No. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, guys. the court. My name is Liz Conroy and I represent the respondent in this matter, Big Mark Corporation. Your honors, the petitioner in this case is asking this court to turn back the hands of time and apply a lower pleading standard to particular cases, thus creating a patchwork of inconsistent pleading requirements and reinstating the pre-Twombly lopsided discovery burden that has plagued civil defendants for years. This court should affirm the 12th Circuit's decision for the following two reasons. First, the Iqbal and Twombly decisions apply to all civil actions and thus require all civil plaintiffs to plead sufficient facts to establish a plausible claim. Second, petitioner's claim falls short as it fails to establish a plausible claim and instead relies on mere conclusory statements. To my first point, this court's decision in Svirkovich versus Surema is still good law in that it underscores the universal application of the federal rules of civil procedure. As such, the Spirkovich court declined to apply the McDonnell Douglas factors as a pleading standard and instead required that employment discrimination plaintiffs, as with all other plaintiffs, be, evaluating according, be evaluated according to the relevant pleading standard at the time. At the time that Spirkovich decided the relevant standard was Conley versus Gibson, now it is Iqbal and Twombly. So, Counselor, can you help us understand, uh, so Twombly is fraud and Iqbal was national security a criminal case. How does that reconcile with our current case, which is a Title VII case? I mean, if anything, shouldn't we have a lesser pleading standard when it's impossible to know all of the facts or why you were fired? Your Honor, in his Iqbal decision, Justice Kennedy clearly pointed out that the plausibility standard has to apply to all civil actions. That way, civil plaintiffs go in with notice of what we require of them when making their complaint. So are, you, um, are you asking us to, to look to require facts to every element of the claim to, to, to make out a case, make out a plausible complaint? Your Honor, while that's certainly in this court's purview to look at all the facts from each of the elements of the complaint, that is not required in order for us to succeed here. We're merely asking that this court use whatever uh, prima facie factors exist, so in, in, in this case the McDonnell Douglas factors, as a prism or an outline for evaluating the claim. The, comp the plaintiff need not meet all of the factors, they simply need to use those factors to establish a plausible claim. But isn't it possible that when we're talking about Title VII claims, the plaintiffs will not be able to know the facts needed in order to plead the McDonnell Douglas factors? They really need discovery in order to have the knowledge of those factors. And is it, is it your position, Counselor, that there were discovery abuses in this case? 
Uh, to answer Your Honor's questions together, there were no explicit discovery abuses in this case, but that does not discount the fact that uh, this court's decision in Twombly and Iqbal were designed to prevent the kind of discovery abuses that have existed in civil, in civil cases for years. Um, the court needs to act as a gatekeeper of sorts. And all that we are asking, and that is consistent with Twombly and Iqbal, is that plaintiffs in, uh, engage in a minimal amount of pre-complaint investigation, not to the level of discovery or evidence, but just a minimal amount of, of investigation to show that there's some observation that supports their claim. Which brings me to my second point. Mr. Duncan has not stated a plausible claim for relief and instead pled facts based on mere conclusions, and as such, his claim should have been dismissed. Under the Twombly and Iqbal framework, courts must first assess the sufficiency of a pleading by eliminating claims that are merely conclusory, and then determine whether the remaining factual allegations plausibly give rise to an entitlement, entitlement for relief. The question for this court then is, what does uh, what does not does not rise to the level of a plausible claim for employment discrimination. There are several options for making a plausible showing for employment discrimination after Twombly and Iqbal. First, while certainly not required, plaintiffs can, in fact, uh, base their claim on the McDonnell-Douglas factors as an outline for their claim, as Your Honor suggested. Second, plaintiffs may plead that they were treated worse than someone similarly situated, use that Counselor, but there was no one who was similarly situated to the plaintiff in this case who was the only white man in uh, a facility of 23 black men. How could he have any kind of comparator to him? Your Honor, that's precisely the type of situation that should have enabled Mr. Duncan to plead some kind of observation. He could plead that uh, a similarly situated white employee or black employee uh, in this case, a black employee or Hispanic employee at the location was treated differently in a particular regard. So for instance, um, whether there was a dispute over, over a disciplinary action, he could plead facts that show that he observed that the black employee was treated more favorably. Something along those lines that say, we are at the same level, we have both been at this job for a certain number of years, but I was treated differently than this employee. Isn't this arguably harder than some of the cases you're citing because they're about when you're not hired for a position, there's going to be a lot more prima facie evidence if you're not given a job than if you're fired after positive performance reviews. I mean, like my co-justice mentioned, he might not have had any opportunity to talk with these people. Absolutely, Your Honor, and we're not saying that that is the dispositive factor, merely that he must have just observed something. So for instance, in the Svirkovich versus Sorema decision, the one piece that is missing here that existed in that case was that uh, Mr. Svirkovich was able to, to uh, plead facts that supported the fact that he was replaced by someone who was not of his uh, nationality, which supported his claim. In this case, there's, there's no such observation. Mr. Duncan cannot plead that he was replaced by someone who was not white or anything similar, simply that he was fired for a reason consistent with the reason given by Mr. Turner, his manager, that he was what not given. The, what about the arguments over the radio station? Your adversary argued that there were racial undertones and that we should assume that uh, for a small plaintiff who might not have the opportunity for discovery, like that should be enough and we should allow them to move into discovery. Why isn't that sufficient? And to add on to that, the, there was a judge who is in charge of making these decisions and they made the decision that this was a plausible or that this complaint survives the, the dismissal stage. So why are we questioning that? To answer your honor's questions in reverse, first, this court's duty in this case is to provide some kind of structure or framework for the district judges as to what and was what and does and does not rise to the level of plausibility. Mr. Mr. Uh, Duncan's claim simply does not meet that level. As Your Honor pointed out, he alleged facts about uh, music choices and uh, how they were evidence in some way of, of this racial bias. However, all of the arguments over the music choices were among employees. There was no observation about the way that his manager, I see that my time has expired, if I may briefly conclude. Mr. Duncan made no observations about how his <coughs> manager is implicated in those observations at all. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. I'm going to do, do an actual rebuttal. <laughs> is it 
just rebuttal yeah. so that you guys have an idea of whoever is um, the petitioner, um, you're going to be giving a rebuttal during your tryout. So um, Kevin's going to give you like a real rebuttal. A real so rebuttal. Stop taking a dive. <laughs> you may proceed. You may. Uh, the respondent in their argument mentioned among the things that Title VII plaintiffs should have to plead uh, in their complaints an intent to discriminate on the part of the employer. And whatever the court decides to do in this case, it should refrain from placing too onerous a burden on plaintiffs to prove intent as early as the pleading stage. One, because it's, in, it's exceptionally hard uh, in these cases to show the employer's subjective state of mind at the time they made the adverse employment decision. But second, because of the informational and power disparities between a single plaintiff and a much more powerful corporation with access to records. In light of that, the court in its holding should avoid creating a catch-22, where in order for plaintiffs to proceed to discovery, we require them to plead facts that they in fact need discovery to uncover in the first place. Thank you, Your Honors. to do their best when they try out. Um, we will be giving you an explanation kind of what was good, what was bad, and kind of how things were dealt with. Um, so we'll start with um, petitioner. Yeah. yeah, let's start with it. Yeah, so uh, your statement of the facts, you should offer one, first of all, the judges. Uh, the reality of this first year competition is on that, petitioner. yeah, on petitioner. The reality of this first year competition is that we all get these bench briefs. You aren't in the video. Oh. As I said, uh, if you're a petitioner, offer a brief recitation of the facts. Don't spend more than a minute on it. The reality of this competition is that we get the bench briefs from your legal writing professors, um, and they're not all created equal, although they all include some facts. Uh, but ideally, um, you have judges that, that read and are familiar with the facts, but more often than not, you're going to get people who need a reminder of what's most salient. Uh, so offer that. Don't spend more than a minute on it. Time is precious up there as petitioner. Um, ask for time for rebuttal, which I did not do. It's one of my first mistakes. Uh, but by and large, the huge issue with my presentation was tone. Because this is a conversation with judges, but uh, one, my attitude was, was piss poor, forgive my language. And, and two, I didn't observe uh, the kind of court decorum that you would expect of somebody in an appellate argument. I apologize if it was too ham-fisted. It's hard to tank like that. Um, but this is your opportunity. Initially in your argument, uh, what's crucial about what was missing in my argument was a roadmap. Uh, any sense of a theme about what the case was about beyond the, the facts? Or, uh, and when I say a roadmap, I mean I, the court should reverse for three reasons. First, second, third. That was uh, absent from my presentation. And the reason why I say that presenting a theme, what the whole argument is about, and giving structure up front, why those are so important is because you, as the first person to speak, uh, have an opportunity to frame the debate, which is crucial, because the judges come in with their own perceptions about what's important uh, in real appellate arguments. They've largely made up their minds on briefs. Uh, but that's your opportunity to frame the discussion. It's invaluable. So make sure that you quickly, succinctly, and clearly establish what you intend to talk about and what you think the big takeaways are. Um, so that was something that was missing from my presentation. Uh, a lot of hand movements. Uh, don't bring a pen up there with you unless you're going to keep it on the paper where I can't see it. Don't flail around with some weapon up here in your hand. Don't grip the podium like I did unless that makes you comfortable. And if you do that, don't get on your haunches. Don't sway from side to side. Basic public speaking things, but be very cognizant of what you're, you're doing with your hands. Um, but my tone was a big issue. When a judge asks you a yes or no question, the answer to that question is 98% of the time yes or no. And in the rare occasion where the answer cannot be yes or no, but is a sometimes or an it depends or a not necessarily your honor, uh, you should be ready to explain why. 
But the first words out of your mouth should be an answer to the question. Half the time I answered uh, a yes or no question with a yes or no, but I didn't elucidate or elaborate on my, my answer, which is almost as bad as getting a yes or no question and then going off on your own tirade. If you get a compound question, which I got up here, uh, what, that is one judge asks one thing and another judge feels it appropriate to step in, uh, and you say you're going to answer both things, answer both things, write them down, don't forget one or both of the questions, I remember them, but I, don't, don't forget them, uh, which is why the pen is important so long as you don't throw it at people or wail around like a maniac. Um, what else did I, did I do wrong here? Don't interrupt the judges. When the, when the judge is speaking and answering a question, it might seem perfectly natural. In conversation, you might do things like, mm-hmm, yeah, definitely. Don't do that. Um, and if you're talking and a judge speaks, stop. Uh, don't compliment a judge's questions. I didn't get a chance to do that. Often, that's another good thing, where if you were having a, a real conversation with a judge and they said uh, something that was quite eloquent or well put, you wouldn't go, oh, that's a great, great point, Your Honor. Uh, don't. I'll do that. They know it's a great point. Uh, we'll know that our questions are hopefully at least relevant, if, if not insightful. Um, so don't do that. Um, don't transition abruptly. The thing about the moot court is, is this, and this is my, my big thing that I, when I talk to two L's, and if I, if I can talk to you guys about it, uh, I try and hammer this home. We give you all of these procedures and things to say, and they're great, and you should know the proper way the court should run, and especially in things like the beginning with the Imre offered, a may, you may proceed, uh, and I still asked if I could go. One, know what the right way to phrase if you, if you can begin your argument is, and two, listen to what the judges are saying, um, and don't feel like you're tethered to moot court phrases. And when I say that, what I mean is the most important thing that we can teach you if you're a part of the moot court honor society, uh, and something that you should already be thinking about if you want to be an oral advocate, is how you stand out from the crowd. That is, we're not looking to create cookie cutter attorneys. We're looking to show how you are unique. You're not just an advocate, you're a brand. It's really the way you should be thinking about yourself. What I tell everyone is to be a person. That's rule number one for me as an advocate. Don't be somebody who's so rigid and uh, mechanical, but think about what distinguishes you from other people and in an appropriate way, play those things up. Because that's what makes somebody, that's the difference really between a decent oral advocate and a great one are those minor inconsistencies. And things like, uh, well, um, vocal noise, stalling tax when you start questions, some of that is gonna be natural. And so if you hear somebody tell you you're doing it too much, you're probably doing it too much. But don't beat yourself up over a handful, because that's how people talk. And if you're up there and you're a little too robotic, it almost makes me suspicious uh, that you've memorized entirely too much. So uh, I guess that's my big takeaway is that uh, Obey decorum and be respectful and have a conversation and uh, obey the moot courtisms and do things the right way, but don't be afraid to add part of yourself to this because in reality that's what I'll be looking for as a judge. And I know a lot of people think the same way. Yeah, my posture. Uh, don't don't cross your legs. Um, like I said before, don't don't lean forward. Don't go on top of the podium. Some some of it's going to be natural. If it feels like it's if it feels like it's wrong, if you have an, an inkling that what you're doing is a little inappropriate, if you're aware at all what you're doing, you don't brown out up there because of nerves, which happens. Um, if it feels a little bit wrong, don't do it. Um, largely keep yourself square behind the podium. The way that I'm dressed. Uh, it's like a high school guidance counselor. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> you, you would trust me to give you advice on the SAT, but this is not business attire. Um, so, and, and I dress slightly nice, but not in a full suit to tell you that if you're less formal than this for the arguments, you're doing something wrong. This, th this is not even the minimum. Uh, so wear, wear a suit, uh, no jeans. Uh, anything else I haven't covered? No? Cool. <laughs> Um, so a few things just to point out. So first is how to answer questions from the bench when you get successive questions. And there are really three options. One, you can answer questions together. And that's really if the theme of the question is essentially the same. If the judges are asking the same question in two different ways, or if they get at the same point you want to make, then you can say to answer your honor's questions together. You can also decide to answer them um, 
in reverse or to answer them in turn. So depending on what point you want to make first, I tried to do it both ways. Um, if there's a clear point you want to make and it's the second question, say to answer your, your honor's question in reverse, just make sure you don't forget. Write a note if you need to, because the worst thing you can do is just drop a question completely, because this is a lot about judge egos and things like that. Um, the other piece is uh, using, using persuasive authority. Make sure that you throw it in. Make sure that not just if prompted, not just if a judge says, tell me a case where this happens, but you're also able to say, here's my point and here's an illustration of that point. The judge wants something broad, but you want to say, not only is this how the court should find, here's an example of when it happened somewhere else, or here's an example of a similar set of facts where they found wrong, or something like that. Just make sure you have that kind of stuff at your fingertips. Um, I usually have some kind of uh, table next to me that has just the case names, where they're from, the year, and brief facts and what the holding is. So that way, if I see an opportunity to reference it, I can just look over on one page, I see that it's there, nail it. Um, another thing that is, I think, a really good tactic, you're gonna be pushed around in a lot of different directions. So to have some kind of just clear sense, I put a little block above that part of my roadmap for my first point and for my second point, what the two or three main things that I want to hit home are in that point. That way, if you're thrown off your game, you just look down, you see, I haven't made that point yet, this is a great transition to that point, I want to make that point, just make sure you nail it, because you're not going to be just reading down the line, you're going to get thrown off. Um, I think that's it. Anything else? Yeah? I, I remember, I told one of my two L competitors last night, um, we were having a little bit of difficulty with questions, and IRAC has not gone away. So you can IRAC your answer to a question. Yeah. Your Honor, I believe that your question is whether Iqbal has overruled Swierkiewicz. According to the Second Circuit in 2012, it has not. Therefore, Swierkiewicz is still good law. I don't or, know if any of that's actually. No, true. yeah, and, and, and a, a, another just issues, great exactly. opportunity to use it is when they say, well, tell me some, some set of facts where this would happen. Don't just make them up, because then you're kind of like lost discovering things, say, here's a clear example. Here was a set of facts in this case, and this is what the court decided, and blah, blah, blah. Record sites? Record sites, which I did not do. Um, so it's just it's something where you get points in competition, uh, setting the record, so a great place to do it is in your facts. If you're asked a question and you say, absolutely, Your Honor, you know, when Mr. Duncan uh, alleged that he was there for 22 years, as seen in the record at page five, things like that. It, it just gives your argument, um, it, it makes it more persuasive. Judges trust you. They're able to know that you're not making up things, that you're able to reference them back to where they should be referenced. So you get points on that, and it's important. And uh, to, uh, to something that we talked about before, but I sort of screwed up the, um, know what you have to concede and know what you, what you can concede and what you just cannot concede. So I threw a question to her to push her argument out to the extreme, like trying to be like, okay, what if we want all these things? Why not? Um, you know, and then you can kind of tell the judge, sure, as long as you win, you can concede things. So remember that because it's very persuasive when you when you can tell someone, okay, you're on there. Even you know, we can we, we'll take that middle ground if that's what you're suggesting for law. We still win for these reasons. And similarly, if you're thrown a question. Just make sure you're aware that a judge is not always trying to fight you. Sometimes a judge wants to find for right. you. Um, so that's what we call softball questions. So just make sure you're aware of them, because it's amazing how many times advocates are asked questions and they start to fight without really listening and realizing all I have to say is absolutely your honor. Yes, that, that's what we should do. Yeah. So just listen. So um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand, ask away. And if not, <laughs> um, my email address is at the bottom of the agenda for this evening. Um, please feel free to um, send me an email with any uh, questions. There will be a member of the um, executive board, a national team, or a 2L coming to each of your classes to briefly talk about the competition, um, just kind of give you some logistical overview type of things uh, the week after spring break. So you you have 
questions that you think of over spring break and you don't want to, if you don't want to email me, um, you can always ask people there, but um, when all else fails, please feel free to email me. If you came in late, um, make sure you pick up a packet in the front. It's really useful. It has all the moot courtisms and it also shows you the sheet that we will be scoring you on. Thank you. Thank you.